Welcome to the HVAC Excellence Conference. The title of this webinar is Demystifying the Thermostatic Expansion Valve. In this webinar, we will discuss one of the most misunderstood components in the vapor compression refrigeration cycle, the thermostatic expansion valve. The TEV or TXV, as it is sometimes called, two acronyms for the same valve. Often condemned and needlessly replaced, the TEV is a relatively self-contained wireless superheat control that has been used in the industry for decades. And yes, I did say wireless. This webinar will describe TEV function, identification and basic analysis techniques. You will learn how TEVs control superheat, what is meant by equalization and bleed ports, the difference between adjustable and non-adjustable valves, the benefits of both balance port and conventional port construction and a whole lot more. Thank you for joining us. The Sporlin division of Parker Hannifin is sponsoring this presentation. Sporlin is a leading manufacturer of HVAC and R components with quality materials and craftsmanship, commitment to innovation and manufacturing excellence, all while providing exceptional service and support for customers. Now get ready. This list I'm going to read is a long one. Their complete line of products include catch-all filter dryers, thermostatic expansion valves, solenoid valves, pressure regulating valves, suction filters, electric valves, controllers, supermarket monitoring solutions, chemicals, smart service tools, zoom lock max, press to connect, and zoom lock push, push to connect refrigerant fittings. Wow, that's a pretty complete list of helpful products, and that's not even everything. Hello, I'm Jim Jansen, Senior Application Engineer for the Sporland Division of Parker Hannifin Corporation, and I'll be doing most of the talking today. In the room with me is Phyllis. She's our Marketing Communications Manager. She's here to keep me from going off track too much or saying something I shouldn't, and anybody that knows me knows that I am capable of both. Currently, I'm involved with training activities, and I help to provide a voice for our online supermarket series of webinars. Now, there's animation on this slide. This is the basic vapor compression refrigeration cycle. And those are the four primary components that consist of the compressor, the condenser, the metering device, and the evaporator. In this particular case, we're talking about thermostatic expansion valves serving as that metering device. And of course, we'll make some mention and talk briefly about distributors. Here's a more elaborate version of that vapor compression refrigeration system. We'll be discuss, discussing some specific components within the highlighted portion that you can see here uh, involving the metering device, distributors, and evaporators. The TEV actually resides right at the interface between the high side and the low side of the system. The TEV's main components are shown here in this slide. The sensing bulb right here is connected to the thermostatic element assembly. Actually, the whole thing is referred to as a thermostatic element assembly. That consists of the bulb, the capillary tube, the diaphragm housing, the button, the lock ring, everything that's used to then subsequently connect to the body of the valve. The thermostatic element assembly, or power head as some people refer to it, also contains something known as a thermostatic charge. The thermostatic charge is generally a mixture of substances that provide a superheat curve and control profile intended for the specific application. When mounted on the suction line, the sensing bulb senses suction temperature causing the bulb pressure to change. This pressure exerts a force on top of the diaphragm. Here's the diaphragm again. In turn, the diaphragm contacts the push rods. Here are the push rods. There are two push rods in this particular valve. The push rods do their job and push the pin out of the port to allow flow to occur. Here's that area. The valve depicted here is equipped with a removable inlet strainer. That's what you see right here. And you can remove and service that strainer and replace it when you isolate the valve from system pressure. There's also an external adjustment assembly included with this particular valve design. Now this one is considered conventional in nature or direct acting as it is sometimes called. It's not balanced port. We'll discuss balanced port construction later in the presentation. But one of the main things, one of the things I really want you to remember, and that's this, 
The thermostatic expansion valve controls superheat at the location of the sensing bulb. That is the primary function of this device. TEVs are not intended to control box or space temperature or relative humidity. And the list goes on. Not suction pressure, not compressor, amp draw, none of those things. It's only meant to control superheat where you've mounted this bulb and where you've tied in the equalizer, something we'll discuss at length. Well, about how much does a thermostatic expansion valve weigh anyway? How about a five ton valve? You go down to the parts house to get one. Do you need to requisition a flatbed truck to get it home? Well, I know when I get on a scale, it says one at a time, buddy. But in this case, the answer is only about two or three pounds depending upon the valve. And how did this concept of tons ever come to be used in reference to valve size? And for that matter, system size and capacity. Well, we're gonna talk about that. Here's how a little history would be appropriate. Prior to the widespread availability of mechanical refrigeration, block ice was harvested from frozen lakes, ponds, and rivers during the cold winter months. It was stored in caves or quarries uh, to be later delivered and used as a means to transfer heat or refrigerate during the warmer months of the year at a home or a business. Even as large industrial mechanical refrigeration systems capable of producing this ice became increasingly commonplace, the daily delivery of block ice remained prevalent, particularly in larger metropolitan areas. Block ice was placed in an ice box like you see here, maybe just a big cooler in a home as a means to refrigerate and preserve fresh foods. And well after mechanical domestic refrigerators became widely available, they were still often referred to as ice boxes by us old timers. The term ton in the refrigeration industry corresponds to the use of ice as a means to refrigerate or transfer heat. The cooling produced by melting one ton of ice in a day is referred to as one ton of refrigeration. It has been calculated by some of these extra smart folks that 288,000 BTUs are required to melt one ton of ice in one 24 hour day. Or said another way, about 12,000 BTUs per hour. That's sometimes referred and abbreviated as BTUH. TVs control superheat at the sensing bulb location. So what is superheat? Superheat is the temperature of a fluid above its saturation temperature. The TV responds to superheat. And there are three things telling the valve what to do. Let's take a look at the cutaway here. And we see some of the primary internal components of the TV. Here's the sensing bulb. Here's that capillary tube. Here's a diaphragm push rods, the pin, the port, and the spring. Now, are, there are three forces that act on the TV to control superheat. The sensing bulb is mounted to the suction line, as you can see here, and it senses suction line temperature. The bulb pressure changes, it might increase or decrease with temperature, increasing the opening force or decreasing the opening force, and that's one of those things. There are two other things two generally closing forces, one sourced from the evaporator pressure or equalizer and another from the closing spring. So the bulb drives the valve open, the equalizer or evaporator pressure closes it and the spring tries to close it. And I like to refer to this as the closing spring because that reminds me what its job happens to be. And the preload on the closing spring is adjusted or set to control the valve at a desired superheat or set point. Now it might be a good time to mention the internal features of the valve that influence capacity. The stroke or the length of the push rods, the diameter of the port, and the angle of the pin are the primary valve features that control capacity. Bleed ports, sometimes utilized by OEMs, essentially add to the overall port diameter and provide for unregulated flow and can add to the performance of the valve. Here's how the bleed port comes into the picture. Certain applications utilizing low starting torque, single phase compressor motors 
will generally benefit from some means of pressure equalization during the system off cycle. Pressure equalization could be necessary since low starting torque compressors may not be capable of restarting against a large pressure differential. Typical applications are small air conditioning and heat pump systems. The permanent bleed port can help accomplish this pressure equalization. Here is an example of a permanent drilled passageway within the structure of the TV. Now the size of this bleed port has been somewhat exaggerated to provide a good visual image, but it simply provides for unregulated flow through the valve. Here's another example of a permanent bleed port that has been added to this cartridge style valve. You can see that drilling down here. In this example of a permanent bleed port, the required passageway has been drilled through the structure of the cartridge assembly to provide the unregulated flow from the inlet side of the valve over here to the outlet side of the port. It is important to know the bleed port also provides an increase in the nominal capacity of the valve. In addition to pressure equalization, this feature can be used to fine tune the capacity of the valve. In this example, the bleed port provides an additional 15% capacity increase compared to the equivalent non-bleed or standard valve. Bleed port percentages can range from a low of around 10% and go as high as 30% and sometimes even more depending upon the manufacturer and the particular expansion valve. The subject of pressure equalization during the system off cycle should not be confused with the external equalizer of the TV. System pressure equalization is accomplished by allowing a certain amount of refrigerant to leak through a drilled passageway or machined notch in the valve seat in order to induce additional flow past the pin in the port. As you can see here in its most basic form, an appropriately sized length of capillary tubing could be utilized to provide the unregulated flow of a bleed port for pressure equalization and enhanced flow when needed. Now, it is time for a short profit generating message from our sponsor. Parker's ZoomBlock Max Press to Connect Refrigerant Fittings is a press to connect technology approved for HVACR operating pressures up to 700 PSI. The technician can quickly connect piping with no torch, no hot work permits, and no fire safety equipment. ZoomLock Max provides a clean, leak-proof connection for today's contractors. Installing new equipment has gotten easier and more efficient. In seconds, connect the refrigerant piping with a press-to-connect tool. HVACR professionals know that time is money. With a simple press, you can impact your company's bottom line by saving time with ZoomLock Max flame-free refrigerant fittings. Professionals set themselves apart with labor and time-saving solutions from Parker Sportman. ZoomLock, the name you know, the brand you trust. Let's continue. Welcome back. Since the main function of the TV is superheat control, it is important to know how to calculate superheat. The right amount of superheat helps to optimize the performance of the evaporator while also protecting the compressor. To calculate superheat, measure the actual suction line temperature and the evaporator pressure. Evaporator pressure is then converted to saturation temperature using a pressure temperature card or even a pressure temperature app. The actual temperature at the bulb should always be higher than the saturation temperature. The difference between suction line temperature and saturation temperature at these conditions is this thing called superheat. Well, why do we need superheat? Well, superheat is insurance. It guarantees that we are sending vapor back to the compressor and not liquid. Most compressors aren't particularly fond of attempting to compress liquid. And consistent liquid flood back can damage compressors by washing away the vital lubricant that they need. And a slug of liquid can be damaged to the, damaging to the compressor as well. Here are two examples. It illustrates the potential for damage to discharge reed valve, as you can see here, or 
in the case of a crankshaft that has certainly come from together, as they say. Now, what does it mean if the TEV is said to be internally equalized? This equalized thing in the terminology tends to cause some confusion for folks. This just means the refrigerant pressure at the inlet of the evaporator will be exerted on the underside of the diaphragm through an internal passage in the valve's body. Now this will, will be used to directly oppose the opening force generated by the bulb. And you can see here is that passageway that we're talking about. If the valve is externally equalized, we'll find a third fitting or connection on the valve. This means in addition to the valve's inlet and outlet connections, there is a third small diameter fitting on the valve body. And you can see that right here. This third connection allows the pressure from a location external to the valve to be sourced as a closing force. And really a more accurate closing force because we wanna, we wanna sample that pressure in the vicinity of the sensing bulb because that's where we're interested in controlling superheat. A small diameter tube from the outlet of the evaporator is connected to the external equalizer fitting. Pressure from the outlet side of the evaporator is then transmitted to the underside of the valve diaphragm to oppose the valve's bulb pressure. An externally equalized valve can be used to replace an internally equalized version of the same valve. That's no problem. Do it all the time. Just make sure to connect the equalizer and don't plug it or cap it. The TEV bulb and equalizer locations are very important. The TEV sensing bulb should be affixed to a horizontal free draining section of the suction line close to the evaporator outlet. And the equalizer line should be popped to, piped to the top of the suction line just downstream of the bulb. You can see that here. Here's the equalizer, it's connected here. There's the bulb. And then here is more detail on bulb placement. If located upstream of the bulb, a small amount of liquid could pass through the equalizer line, causing the valve to close and starve the coil. For instance, if you switch these two locations. Care should also be taken to be sure the bulb is not exposed to the cool airflow from the refrigerated case or the condition, air conditioned space. It could have a detrimental effect on the performance of the valve. The same could be said regarding elevated temperature exposure, like exposure to the warm discharge air or from some other source of heat. Both could influence the operation of the TV. It's good practice to use the provided straps to mount the bulb. They do work. It's kind of what we depicted here. Other mounting methods, such as zip ties or duct tape, are not recommended. These other methods do not provide adequate strength and will not hold up through the freeze and thaw, thaw processes that we're going to see in these systems. Let's just review this slide for a minute. I'd say yes to the appropriate accessories to fit the bulb to the suction line like you see here. And again, no to zip ties and duct tape and be mindful of the interference that you might encounter with fittings in the suction line think it warrants even a little additional detail regarding the bulb installation. Yes, I'm all too familiar with the knuckle slicing little perforated brass strap devils that some manufacturers ship with their product, but they do work. There are other ways to attach the bulb to the suction line. Some work better than others. Clamps and clips are widely used. Hose clamps are even sometimes deployed, but there are problems with these methods. Now note the placement of the fastener in conjunction with the position of the bulb in the suction line. You see there's almost 90 degrees separating these two. And notice the gap between the nut and the head of the screw. This is all needed to help pull or ratchet the parts all together. It is important to be able to achieve a snug fit between the bulb and the suction line and not crush the bulb. So I'm going to refer to this yes version, but it is possible to damage the bulb, even dent the bulb, and still have a loose fit. Take a look at this no version. Now something is a question that comes up oftentimes, and that's regarding vertical line bulb placement options. 
And we'll talk about that a little later in the presentation. Earlier, we said there are three things that tell the valve what to do and to ultimately control superheat at the bulb location. And there's a fourth thing that sometimes tries to interfere with this process. The conventional style valve has the pin acting in the port. Liquid pressure pushing on the pin causes a fourth force to act on the pin in the opening direction. That's not a good thing. Balance port valves, like the one depicted here, have an integral pin and push rod assembly. You can see the detail over here. The balance port style valve balances the liquid pressure across the upper shoulder of the push rod, as you can see right here, against the lower pin surface. Variations in liquid pressure have little to no effect on these valves due to the similar area of these two surfaces. That's a good thing. Next, we'll review several different versions of balance port construction so you can see the differences. Here is what's referred to as a semi-balance port valve. It's used on some of the big industrial products that have been manufactured over the years. And this is an early balancing technique. And this has, valve has two ports, an upper and a lower. Part of the inlet flow tends to open the valve and the other flow path tends to close it. And this design is only considered semi-balanced and you'll notice that the upper port is slightly smaller as compared to the lower port. Hence the reason for the semi-balanced moniker. Maybe you could argue the valve would be more precisely balanced if both ports were the same size. Well, maybe so. However, it'd be significantly more difficult to assemble the darn thing if that were the case. This version is generally considered to be more balanced than the other designs. This balance port valve design features a piston that seats against a single port, like you see right here. A passageway drilled through the piston, that's this passageway right here, allows liquid line pressure, liquid line pressure, to be transmitted to the bottom of the piston. A special seal is fitted to the circumference of the piston assembly, which traps the liquid line pressure under the piston. So you have the same pressure above and below this piston assembly. This neutralizes the opening force of the liquid line pressure on top of the piston almost perfectly. In this design, which is similar to the first actual valve that we saw at the beginning of this little sequence, a single push rod is used, which incorporates a tapered pin. Here's that push rod. The inlet pressure tending to open the port is offset by the same inlet pressure acting on the push rod in the opposite direction. So here's that inlet, here's that upper shoulder, and here's the exposed pin. The port area is intended to be nearly identical to the area displaced by the push rod. If one were to perform a force analysis on the inlet side of the pin in the port, the analysis would indicate the larger the pressure variation or the larger the effective area of these parts, the greater would be the resulting opening force. With smaller fractional capacity valves, the effective area can be quite small and the resulting opening force can also be quite small one could deduce the favorable impact of a balanced port valve design on fractional capacity applications would be ne negligible, whereas on larger capacity applications, it could be critical. The same rationale could apply to typically high pressure refrigerants. For example, R410A. This means it is typically a good idea to use TVs with a balanced port for R410A applications especially when those applications are relatively large in capacity. Now you can't talk about superheat without talking about adjusting TVs. I guess that's something that folks talk about on a regular basis. And the superheat can be adjusted on TVs that are equipped with an adjustment assembly. And here are some brief instructions on how to go about that process. First, Remove the seal cap, and that's the seal cap right here. Some valves have a packing gland, what is inside the bowels of the valve. 
If so, loosen the packing nut if that valve is equipped with such. Note the tool that's being used here can both loosen the packing nut and subsequently can be used to adjust the valve. Then adjust the stem one quarter to half turn and let the system settle out for 15 to 20 minutes before attempting further adjustments. Patience is a virtue in this endeavor. Retighten the packing nut and then reinstall the seal cap when you're done. Now this is important. I can't tell you how many times I've gone into a mechanical room and I see a lineup of valves if, they're, if it's equipped that way, no seal caps. Or you'll look at some case installations and no seal caps. Seal caps are gone off of all the valves, no matter what they are. That's, that's bad practice. If the seal cap is not reinstalled and tightened, system refrigerant could and will very likely leak at that, inter, at that interface. The seal cap, in this case, uses a knife edge joint to seal and it constitutes the final seal. Now here's something that's important as well. Never force the adjustment stem in either direction. Exerting too much force at the adjustment stops on either end of the adjustment range can result in damage to the adjustment mechanism. So I guess it goes without saying, you don't wanna use a two foot pipe wrench to make adjustments to the TV. That's why we offer this small contraption to do the job. Here is a side-by-side -side comparison of a non-adjustable versus an externally adjustable TV. Here's the non-adjustable version. Here's the adjustable version. You can see they have very similar parts, valve body, push rods, pin and carrier, spring, until we get down into this area. The adjustable valve has an adjustable bottom cap. The non-adjustable valve has a spring guide and a bottom cap. Now, you removing the bottom cap, wrongly thinking that it is a seal cap on this non-adjustable version can result in a considerable leak. Big problem. Now, thermostatic charges, we're gonna briefly talk about that. This is not a one size fits all kind of thing. The thermostatic charges, the magic stuff that's installed in the thermostatic element assembly or power head. It helps the TV to control the right superheat curve profile for the application. This is a very approximate graphical representation of superheat as evaporator temperature varies for a wide range of different thermostatic charges. Now, some thermostatic charges include something called a pressure limiting feature. You can see that here in this gas cross charge that's depicted. The maximum operating pressure charge or MOP as it's sometimes called, limits the suction pressure returning to the compressor under high load situations. If you're familiar with it, in practice, it acts somewhat like a crankcase pressure regulating valve. Often this feature is beneficial on conventional systems. That's a system with one compressor, one evaporator, uh, where additional compressor horsepower is not readily available during high load situations like you might have on a refrigerator rack. You'd see this maybe on a small to medium sized air conditioning system. The thermostatic element assembly or power head for a TV with the MOP feature has a limited amount of liquid in the charge constituents that resides within the bulb and the whole assembly. Now, when high suction temperatures occur, that limited amount of liquid could eventually be boiled away, leaving only vapor. Without adequate liquid to continue the process, the pressure plateaus in the bulb ultimately limiting the suction pressure at the compressor inlet. That's what its job is. And it's that time again for another short profit generating message from our sponsor. Parker's Zoom Lock Push Push to Connect refrigerant fittings allow contractors to make secure leak-free connections. No brazing torch needed. No press tools or jaws are necessary. Connect copper with a simple push with no problem. Installing new equipment has gotten easier and more efficient. In seconds, connect the refrigerant piping with a simple push. 
HVACR professionals know that time is money. With a simple push, you can impact your company's bottom line by saving time with ZoomLock Push Push to Connect Refrigerant Fittings. Professionals set themselves apart with labor and time-saving solutions from Parker Sporlin. ZoomLock, the name you know, the brand you trust. Let's get started again. Welcome back. Next, we will discuss troubleshooting techniques. To begin the troubleshooting process, we need to know the high and low side pressures and actually what refrigerants actually in the system. That might sound kind of trite, but anymore, as many different refrigerants that are available, that can be a daunting endeavor. Beyond this basic information, it would be really handy to know the evaporator superheat suction pressure or low side pressure, and the liquid temperature and pressure. And we can use that to determine the level of subcooling present in the system. Yeah, I know all of this may seem to be a stretch, but it is really useful when attempting to troubleshoot a system and analyze failure modes. It's particularly helpful if you're calling in to tech support at a manufacturer to get their assistance. When TVs are not performing as desired, they can do a number of things. They can overfeed, resulting in a flood potentially. They can underfeed or starve, or they can even hunt. Now, there are many reasons for a high superheat condition to occur. Let's just re review the slide here briefly. Contamination. Contamination is one of the single biggest culprits of components within a vapor compression refrigeration system. And that can consist of moisture, dirt, wax, acid, an incorrect superheat adjustment. Charge migration. We'll talk about charge migration here in a minute. We can have a thermostatic element assembly that's lost all its magic stuff. Or we can have the wrong thermostatic charge on an application. We might have what would be intended for refrigeration applications on an air conditioning unit. There might not be an external equalizer when there's one needed. Uh, the external equalizer location may be incorrect. There might be a restrict, restricted or a capped equalizer. This equalizer thing is a big deal. There might be a low refrigerant charge in the system. We might have flashing at the TV inlet without subcooling. Might have low pressure drop at the TV. We might actually have an undersized TV. For MOP type charges, we may need to consider the potential for charge migration if the system is not operating properly and we're seeing an incorrect superheat. Remember, there's a limited amount of liquid in these MOP charges. Charge migration occurs when an MOP element assembly becomes colder than the sensing bulb. This can happen sometimes in package equipment that's located outdoors, for instance, in a cold environment. Refrigerant that should be in the bulb, the charge constituents that should be in bulb migrate to the element and we no longer have good control and operation of the TV. Refrigerant, even thermostatic charge constituents seem to always be looking for the coldest spot in any given system. Now to diagnose charge migration, if you suspect that's what's occurring, you could increase the temperature of the element assembly is what we've shown here. We're showing the application of a, of a wet, warm rag over that valve body and element assembly. If after you've done that, you subsequently hear the surge of refrigerant flow, you may have indeed diagnosed charge migration as the problem. Then going forward, the system needs to be modified to prevent this from happening again. Things like insulating the thermostatic element assembly, providing some means of heat to the element, now not to the bulb, but to the element, or installing a more appropriate thermostatic charge type are all potential options for correction to this problem. Taking the matter of charge migration one step further, it is possible for the charge constituents to migrate simply to the capillary tube if it is colder than the bulb assembly. If this is suspected, Here's a solution. Just to help you see what's going on here, here is the cap tube leaving the expansion valve. And you can see what we've done here is we've 
routed the capillary tube next to the liquid line and subsequently insulated it. This will ensure that it will remain warmer than the bulb location, which is over here. Because we want the charge constituents to remain in the bulb so that they can tell the valve what to do. Now, on another matter, we've been often asked about vertical suction line installations of the sensing bulb. Now, when there is no room for the preferred horizontal free draining suction line location, which this would constitute that horizontal free draining location. And especially if the TV also includes the so-called MOP style charge, one could install the bulb with the capillary tube and the charging tip on the top of the bulb as an option and attach it in a vertical installation as what we've depicted here. This may help to thwart charge migration potential and it can be made to work. If a dead thermostatic element assembly is suspected, increase or decrease the bulb temperature and look for changes in suction temperature or pressure. Now, you might ask, what's a dead element? Well, when all the thermostatic charge constituents have escaped, the element is considered to be without life. It can't tell the valve what to do anymore. It's dead. It's kind of like when the magic smoke escapes from electrical or electronic devices. You can't put it back in it. The thermostatic element or power head can be removed once the TV has been isolated from the system refrigerant pressure. Of course, replacement is only an option if one can actually remove the thermostatic element assembly or power head. Some valves have an integral element assembly. Many manufacturers have made valves like this over the years and continue to do so to this day. Valves like this would need to be replaced altogether in order to deal with a dead element assembly. An overfed evaporator typically has low superheat and could be experiencing liquid flood back to the compressor. On conventional systems, that is one compressor or one evaporator, we would expect the suction pressure to be high if the system is being overfed. Rack systems with evaporator pressure regulators or EPRs, however, may not exhibit high suction pressure. Possible causes of overfeeding may be due to an oversized TV or even the wrong thermostatic element assembly, excessive seat leakage, a low superheat adjustment, or even contamination in the valve that's holding it, holding it open. Remember I said contamination is one of the single biggest culprits. If the compressor is not making capacity, the TV may ultimately overfeed. If true suction pressure is not seen by the TV due to poor thermal contact or a warm installation location, the TV may overfeed. Remember, it gets back to that bulb installation process. If the external equalizer is piped downstream of an evaporator pressure regulator, lower suction pressure may be seen by the equalizer and provide less closing force to the TV and could, yes, you guessed it, contribute to an overfed evaporator. Problems can arise when a TV hunts, causing superheat to swing. Some limited hunting is, ex is acceptable and normal, but moderate to severe hunting can cause control issues and you can risk flooding the compressor. Potential causes include extremely low loads, an aggressively oversized TV, oil logging in the evaporator, poor airflow across the evaporator, and poor refrigerant distribution. These possible causes should be analyzed before adjusting the superheat on the thermostatic expansion valve. Now, why use a distributor? Well, let's briefly discuss distributors. I think we got a little animation on this slide so we can see the main components once again and let that go away. That distributor is an important device connected to the outlet of the metering device or TV. And you see that here in this particular example. The outlet of the distributor is fabricated with the appropriate outlet circuits in order to provide a flow path for refrigerant to each corresponding evaporator coil circuit. That's not all it does. It does some more things as well. 
It's designed to supply equal percentages of refrigerant liquid and vapor to each of these evaporator coil circuits. Now this is an issue because even though the refrigerant may be 100% liquid and even subcooled when it enters the metering device, it is gonna change phase to a certain degree and flash resulting in two phase liquid and vapor as it leaves the metering device. So that's what that distributor is intended to do is help solve the two phase flow problem. Now let's briefly talk about two phase flow. If a simple header is used to divide the flow into each of the evaporator circuits, those circuits will not receive the same equal amounts of refrigerant from a phase perspective. Let's take a look at, at examples on the, on the slide. Gravity and friction will come into play and the lower circuits of the evaporator will invariably receive the most liquid resulting in hunting or starving problems. The upper circuits will likely be starved for refrigerant, thus reducing the effectiveness of the evaporator. If it's single phase flow, header assembly works just fine. It's used in a number of locations throughout vapor compression refrigeration system. But feeding the evaporator is not one of those places. Now, this is somewhat of a review, but it's important. When selecting a TEV for use with a distributor, an internally equalized valve must be used to compensate for the distributor pressure drop. The distributor pressure drop also reduces the available pressure drop across the TV. So it means the distributor pressure drop must be estimated before selecting the TV. Also, an externally equalized thermostatic expansion valve is good practice if there's an excessive amount of pressure drop through the evaporator and no distributors being deployed. Now this image shows an actual cutaway of the distributor. Here you can see the body of the distributor, the retaining ring, the nozzle, and the drilled circuit passageways in this particular style of distributor. Again, nozzle selection and tube selection are critical features of the distributor. Now let's review some of the, the slide for some troubleshooting guides. The TVs hunting, are there some odd front pattern of frost, uneven air distribution, really dirty filters, if it's air conditioning, can cause some problems. You need to check for circuit, lo circuit loading and check nozzle size. Is the coil severely frosted? Is there a circuit tube restriction? A leak check of the evaporator coil will not necessarily reveal a plugged circuit in a distributor. Each circuit should be individually checked with a probe wire or air jet or flow meter to detect a restricted circuit following the brazing operation when this is all being installed. Now, some people will intentionally plug one or more distributor outlets because the correctly configured distributor is not available when they go to install this assembly. That's not the best idea, but if you're gonna do it, and it's absolutely necessary to do so, it should be done symmetrically. Always use an externally equalized TV with a distributor. The filter dryer is intended to remove contamin contamination from the refrigeration system and protect system components. Anything in the system besides refrigerate, refrigerant and lubricant is considered a contaminant. A good filter dryer removes moisture, acid, sludge, varnish, and wax from the system. Remember I said the primary function of the TV is, you know, a control of superheat at the sensing bulb location. However, TVs are the best secondary filter you can get. Let's just review the slide for animation because you would put a new filter dryer in the system during an initial install. If you've opened the system for repair, if the pressure drop is excessive, moisture indicates five PSI or more, indicating a loss of subcooling. The moisture indicator shows water's present. Acid test indicates acid. During the course of a compressor, clean up during a, following a burnout, during a major one, you might even also want to install a suction line filter dryer to help remove acids and debris. And finally, after a final cleanup. Now, identification of the TEV. 
to completely identify most any manufacturer's expansion valve. You need to know the body type, refrigerant in the system. Does it have an external equalizer? What the capacity of the valve happens to be? Thermostatic charge. Are there any suffix letters indicating bleeds of the inlet and the outlet connection sizes and style, capillary tube length? Are there any prefix letters or numbers that define the valve? All of those things go into defining the thermostatic expansion. Now we're starting to wrap this up. We're here to let you know that we're here for you. We're here to help. Sporlin will supply free of charge to you everything from educational packets, pocket cards, quick tip booklets, pressure temperature charts, wall posters, and counter mats, and a whole lot more. You can reach us by calling the general number for Sporlin headquarters at 636-239-1111. You can also dial technical support directly at 636-392-392. 3906. You can email us. We're available 24-7 at sporlin.com. You can check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and on YouTube to see our online training videos and webinars. This concludes our discussion on thermostatic expansion valve. I really hope you learned something and thank you for joining us. Quality, integrity, tradition. For over 80 years, these words have been synonymous with the products and people of Sporlin. Our products are made in the USA, and our people are the reason that Sporlin continues to raise the bar in the design and manufacturing of contaminant control, refrigerant flow control components, and solutions. Our 60 sales engineers, averaging 17 years of industry experience, can advise you on the best solutions for your system. Sporland's premier customer service representatives support your wholesaler, ensuring you get the part you need when you need it. After the purchase, you can rely on our experienced technical support team to help with product installation and system troubleshooting. Sporland provides all that is needed to make sure your current systems and future installations run at peak performance for an industry that demands quality products and service. We are continually expanding and developing our products and testing capabilities so that Sporlin solutions provide the best reliability and performance available. As the industry leader in the design and manufacturing of expansion valves, pressure regulators, contaminant controls, accumulators, solenoid valves, couplings, distributors, brace-free fittings, tubing, and tools, Sporlin continues to find new ways to improve quality, productivity, and ease of use, making your job easier. Our engineers and product designers stay on top of all regulatory trends and work to validate that each product is properly designed for new refrigerants and their applications. Sporlin, creating products that provide solutions so that your air conditioning and refrigeration needs are not only met, but exceeded. Made in America, with over 80 years of history and experience behind us, it's our mission to continue to offer the highest quality products, innovative solutions, and unparalleled support in the market. Quality, integrity, tradition. Sporlin.